Across the education sector, teachers are seeking greater balance to persist in their role and are leaving the profession at increasing rates due to burnout. We have learned that having insufficient time to plan for lessons and collaborate with peers, as well as having a large number of scholars who are behind grade level, are two major contributors to this burnout. This national challenge that our teachers face for sustainability and balance is directly connected to our scholars' outcomes. Hi, I'm Sonia Grant, Vice President of Network Initiatives for Alliance College Ready Public Schools. Alliance is the largest charter network in Los Angeles, serving 26 schools and nearly 13,000 scholars. In the fall of 2023, two of our middle schools, Alliance College Ready Middle Academy 4 in the South LA Watts neighborhood, and Valera Middle Academy in the Sun Valley area launched Reimagining the Alliance Educator, an initiative designed to help Alliance get ahead of industry trends by increasing well-used planning time and providing additional support to scholars who are behind grade level. At our Reimagining the Alliance Educator pilot schools, we have more than doubled planning time for our teachers, created new targeted intervention opportunities for scholars, and significantly expanded enrichment opportunities at each school. Now, we hope to pass along what we've learned to give you tools for your own school in hopes of spreading this groundbreaking work. Alliance College Ready Public Schools brings to you Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast. Practical discussions and advice on finding greater balance for teachers and better outcomes for scholars. On today's episode, we'll go into depth on how it's not just about teachers getting more time for planning and scholars more time for intervention. It's equally important that teachers have strong planning, observation, feedback, and coaching systems in place for the Reimagining the Alliance Educator Program to be successful. I think the biggest lesson I'm taking away, and it, it's interesting how obvious it became by the time second semester rolled around, is if you are going to give, if the school is going to give more time for planning, it needs to be paired with clear expectations, timelines, and deliverables. Because without that level of structure, it is really difficult to ensure that the time is being used in service of high leverage things. Coming up on Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast. My name is Eva Flores Coops. I've been an educator for 17 years and am celebrating my 15th year at this school at Middle 4. As a reminder for our listeners, through the pilot program, Middle 4 implemented a 4 plus 1 model, where teachers have one full day of structured planning time, as well as two separate planning blocks each week. In total, all teachers have roughly 11 hours of weekly planning time. In addition, Middle 4 launched an expanded math intervention program in order to support the school's goals to continue to grow math outcomes for scholars. So, Eva, we talked about the challenges our teachers face for sustainability. And in our last episode, I talked to Eric Carlstone, our principal at Valera Middle Academy, about his schedule design. How did you decide on the schedule design for your school? And what was the actual planning process of creating and organizing this structure like? So I think it's important to name that we've been through, at this point, six different prototypes of the schedule, all in response to stakeholder feedback. So in first semester, it was really clear that we wanted to create planning opportunities, remote planning days for teachers, where they would have uninterrupted time to do the many behind the scenes things that teachers need to do. So in semester one, we were able to draft a master schedule that allowed teachers to receive this planning day bi-weekly. And there was very little structure in terms of what they did with that time. And so depending on teacher experience, we saw varied results with how they leveraged that time. And rightfully so, right? A new teacher still learning the ropes of what the highest leverage actions are would spend hours and hours grading when in reality, investing in intellectual preparation could have had a bigger return on that investment. And so taking those learnings and the big, big, big push that our teachers gave us to convert the biweekly planning to weekly in second semester, we rolled out our 
third or fourth prototype of the schedule because, again, response to stakeholder engagement gave us an opportunity to pivot. And so in second semester, which is currently where we're at, all teachers receive a full remote planning day every week. And so during this time, though, there is a lot more structure than there was in semester one, where teachers are actually spending the first two hours of their planning virtually meeting with their department. And in that space, we get to do lots of different things depending on the time of year. That looks like student work analysis, right, where as a teacher, I can share the latest results of my exit ticket and my seventh and eighth grade counterparts can give me ideas on how to address, well, first identify the gap and then how to address that gap. If there isn't a meaty assessment for me to take a look at, I might bring my next lesson in and say, I know this is an area where my kids are going to get stuck. Give me some ideas. How do you in seventh grade address this concept? And so there's opportunity for shared intellectual preparation as well. And then, of course, lastly, just department time to align on strategies and make sure that what sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are doing in terms of signature practices are being developed throughout the course of the semester. So that was, I think, a huge success this year. And yet there were still some pain points, which is why we are iterating yet again. And in 24-25, we are launching with some additional pivots. Teachers continue to have their remote planning days, but how we leverage that planning time is going to continue to be refined. We're also strengthening the levers of intellectual preparation and student work analysis. Now that we have a baseline understanding of how those practices work, we are now elevating that practice to make sure that we think about our most vulnerable populations and then addressing just some minor pain points that we've identified from potentially like an overlap between a PE class and lunch, while also considering things like what is the best method for math intervention. So we continue to iterate, and I think my staff has gotten really comfortable with the idea of trying things out for a semester, providing really pivotal feedback, and then making shifts as we go along. And also, I know that teachers have some additional planning time outside of their planning day on a weekly basis. Can you talk a little bit about that as well as the scholar intervention programming that you designed as a part of the pilot? Absolutely. So in addition to the weekly remote planning day where they have a meeting morning and then they are uninterrupted for the rest of the day, teachers also have an hour of prep time three times a week while on campus. And our reasoning is let's leverage that time for in-person collaboration. So right now, during those three prep periods that I have in a week, I meet with my coach to debrief the observation. I also meet with my SPED co-teacher to help me think through how am I going to support my scholars who qualify for special education services. We co-plan. We make sure that we're clear on how we're going to co-facilitate a lesson. Often, too, teachers choose to engage in grade-level team meetings to think through strategies to support individuals. So that particular, the time that is here on campus is also very collaborative because teachers can expect that when their planning day rolls around, come 10.30 a.m., they will be uninterrupted and will be able to do that individual work from home. I think it would be helpful for folks to understand what you learned about the planning needs of your teachers as individuals, as well as teacher teams as a result of the pilot? That's a great question. I, I think the biggest lesson I'm taking away, it's interesting how obvious it became by the time second semester rolled around, is if you are going to give, if the school is going to give more time for planning, it needs to be paired with clear expectations timelines and deliverables. Because without that level of structure, it is really difficult to ensure that the time is being used in service of high leverage things. And again, so much of that depends on teacher experience too, right? But ideally, you are spending 75% of your time planning lessons, Mm -hmm. right? And maybe only 10% grading. By having those parameters, By having a way for teachers to deliver something back to us that coaches can review and provide feedback on, I think that's my biggest takeaway because it has empowered the leadership team to be able to respond to teacher needs and offer really strategic support, as opposed to in semester one, where it was really just, 
you have the time, do with it what you think you need to do. It was just really difficult to track how the time was being used and the impact it was having. So I definitely say that is my biggest takeaway, the clarity of expectations, timelines, and deliverables. That being said, too, paired with room to be flexible, depending on what individuals need. Amazing. And what about the scholar programming that you've designed? So the scholar intervention programming has been, I think, probably one of the most exciting parts of the pilot because it gave us the space, for lack of a better word, the space in the master schedule to infuse intervention, not just for reading, which we've had for many, many years. We have had a strong reading program where scholars take a reading class in addition to their English class that is differentiated depending on their need. So if they're three to five years below grade level in terms of reading, they take a class with a certain curriculum. One to three, it's a separate curriculum. And reading at grade level, it's yet a different curriculum. So we've had that in place for some time. What this pilot allowed us to do is to start thinking about how we parallel that in the math world. And so this year, every single one of our scholars is enrolled in a math intervention class that, again, is differentiated. We partner with air tutors, math air tutors, to provide small group, high dosage tutoring virtually. And so in groups of three to five, kiddos are meeting with their tutor three times a week. And we leverage data from the iReady, that assessment that measures growth, to determine what skills they need to work on. And so as we've paired that reading intervention with the math intervention, with the core classes in ELA in mathematics, students are getting both grade level experiences, but also that additional targeted intervention that helps fill any gaps that they have. And you've talked a little bit about the shifts that you're planning to make to the planning structures for the Mm -hmm. upcoming school year. Can you talk a little bit about the shifts that you're making to your math intervention programming, the rationale behind that as well? Yes. So that, that shift that's coming, I'm excited about, and I think we've been very strategic about it, but I'll name that what was, that was one of the challenges. It's in response to one of the challenges of this work. This work has been incredibly rewarding, but there are hard things about it. And I think it's important to name that budget-wise, that's something that schools need to think about when they endeavor to do something like this. Because if you are giving teachers a full planning day, that is a full day of teachers not teaching. And so you need to think about what that alternative looks like. And so this year, we invested in this partnership with Air Math Tutors, and it was pricey. It was it was very pricey. I do not regret making that choice because I think it gave us a really good starting point to pivot from. But we did have to dip into our reserve as a school to be able to fund that shift. And so thinking about next year, we learned where Air Tutors is strong and where there is room for development. And so we're making pivots in 24-25. Specifically, we are not providing math intervention to all scholars. That's because not all scholars need it. We learned that. With the right data, we can determine which scholars need the extra support and which scholars can engage in other electives that will enrich their academic experience. And so next year, we are doubling down with our sixth graders. So all sixth graders are getting math intervention. Instead of partnering with air tutors, we hired a live teacher who can pivot and make sure that she responds to scholar needs. In that sense, the classes will be small with 18 scholars per class, which is the ideal for intervention. And then in seventh and eighth, we're going to be more strategic. And so we are continuing our partnership with air tutors. But instead of ensuring that every scholar gets it, we're selecting 60 kiddos per grade level who are going to need it the most and creating space in our schedule for them to get that while other scholars get academic enrichment in another way. I'm curious to understand what all teachers receive and then where there are modifications based off of areas that teachers would really benefit from additional support in. Yes. So at Middle Academy 4, we, I think we have a really strong system of support for teachers when it comes to planning and instructional practice. So all teachers receive, depending on experience and need, either weekly or biweekly observation and coaching. And so we have assistant principals and instructional leads who will spend time in classrooms, then debrief with teachers and give them action steps to help 
continue to build their instructional practice. In addition, all teachers participate in department meetings weekly, where we do an array of things from analyzing student work to reviewing lessons together to practicing lessons to having conversations about how we align from sixth to eighth grade. And then, of course, all teachers participate in weekly professional development. And so those are the things that everybody gets. But I think what happens within each of those containers is where there is room to really differentiate and ensure that teacher needs are met. And so I mentioned, depending on the teacher, some teachers get weekly coaching, some teachers get biweekly coaching. And that has to do with experience, but it also has to do with need. Additionally, our student work analysis varies not by individual, but by department. So for example, our math team has been reviewing data for much, much longer than say our history team has. And so if you sit in on a student work analysis meeting for math, that's gonna look and feel very different than it is in history. The pilot has also given us an opportunity to think about how we support new teachers via a mentor teacher model. By creating time and space for this type of collaboration, we've been able to leverage teachers who have more experience in an area, either with a specific grade level or in a content area, to work with and provide coaching to newer teachers, either in terms of experience or in that content area. So let's talk a little bit about collaboration. You mentioned that teachers use their in-person planning time during the course of the week to collaborate Mm -hmm. with their co-teacher, with their grade level teams. Could you talk a little bit about what collaboration this pilot has really helped to support and what you see as a result of that collaboration? Absolutely. I, I think the pilot, the biggest pivot the pilot has brought is now there are formal structures for collaboration. There's always been some level of collaboration, but the fact that now there is a protected time and a protected space with an agenda and a goal for people to come together has really elevated not just the impact of that collaboration, but also the participation across the board. So before, collaboration was really either I opt in or I don't, whereas now, even some of our more veteran teachers are speaking to the power of every Wednesday, for example, I meet with my science department. And though I've been teaching for 15 years, I now get to see this through a different lens, or I now get to have a conversation with my seventh grade counterpart who really pushes me to think about it, about teaching this concept in a different way. And so I'd say collaboration time has increased, yes, but also just the opportunity to have a structured way to collaborate where every voice is valued and everyone's experience comes to the table has made the biggest impact. Have you noticed any shifts in the tone and dynamic with your team as a result of this more intentional, structured collaboration time? I think it's so interesting. Our collaboration time that happens during those planning days, that one and a half hour meeting every week, are facilitated by our instructional leads. And so every department has an instructional lead. And at the end of last semester, when I told them, So from now on, in semester two, we're going to be having weekly meetings where you're going to come together for an hour and a half and have these conversations. It was like, do we really need that much time? I don't know that I need that much time. I'd rather have the time to work. It was really about investing people and seeing the power of this collaboration time. Literally just a week ago to close out the year, I had another meeting with that instructional leadership team where we had a conversation around what stays the same, what pivots, what do we modify for next year in terms of student work analysis, and the length of that meeting or the frequency of that meeting was not questioned at all. If anything, it was really just pushes to think about different and new things that can live in that space, but the fact that that space exists, no one advocated to change that. So yes, there's definitely been a significant mindset shift even amongst the veteran teachers who facilitate this work. That's monumental. I think so too. I remember working with you and your team to pull together those planning structures in January and could also sense that folks were a little uncertain. And that's just so powerful to hear that those structures have been validated and that you're continuing them into next year. I'm so happy to hear that. And Eva will be with us throughout the season. 
Next, we'll talk to a teacher from Middle 4 who feels he's able to be a better teacher thanks to this pilot program. When we come back to Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast. Thousands of parents across Los Angeles have made Alliance College Ready Public Schools their child's educational home. And thanks to our talented teachers, our scholars are doing amazing things. We're recognized at the local, state, and national levels, including by the U.S. News and World Report for operating some of the best schools in the country. With 96% of our graduates accepted into college, we are making a real difference in the lives of our local communities. But it's all for naught if we aren't renewed. We need enthusiastic supporters like you, ones who will collaborate with policymakers, help with letter writing campaigns, and advocate for us at board meetings. Every staff, scholar, and family has a role to play to make sure we're renewed. So reach out to your local Alliance school and ask how you could become an Alliance advocate or visit laalliance.org slash get dash involved. Together, we can foster a generation of well-rounded young adults who are resilient learners, community advocates, and wellness seekers. Together, we are one Alliance. Learn more at laalliance.org slash get dash involved. Welcome back to Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast. I'm here with Caleb Klinger, who we met in our first episode. I'm Caleb Klinger. I am the eighth grade U.S. history teacher at Alliance College Ready Middle Academy 4. I'm curious to know what support you received during the course of the pilot and how that support compares to what you received previously and what the impact of that support has been for you. I know that right before the pilot, some of the things that was very consistent is I would have my coaching meetings, but there is definitely some inconsistencies. For instance, our data analysis meetings or GLT meetings, that would just be because we were once again crunched for time. It might have felt like some things were rushed from time to time and possibly that we wouldn't have time to finish everything. But I feel like our meetings are a little, are much more, not a little, much more intentional this year with time to go through our data analysis meetings. Like we're not rushed. We can figure out what students are actually understanding from the content. We can go through and kind of give ideas and really try to understand the root causes of any difficulties that we've seen without feeling rushed. For GLT meetings, we're able to take more time to plan things like field trips, activities, events, and really focus on our scholars and what they need. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the acronym GLT, that stands for Grade Level Team. GLT leaders are responsible for conducting weekly grade level meetings. We can focus more on the cultural aspect of things as well. I know that I'm able to use planning time off of campus, whenever I'm on campus, I can check in with staff a lot more. I can have those conversations that I might have felt either rushed to have before, or I felt like there's a time constraint. If I know that I have more prep time than what I have physically at school, it doesn't feel like it's a choice. Okay, do I have a conversation with my English teacher to talk about a student, or do I finish grading this exam that they need to know the results for the grading deadline? There's not necessarily this choice. I can kind of do both. And I feel like that's been really helpful. And then I'd say that kind of pushing it as well, I've been able to find that I've had more personal time as well for many different things. Time to decompress. Self-care is something that I've seen that I've been able to do a lot more, right? Just taking a time to decompress, reset for the week. I know that something that's also coming up for me as well, kind of a professional goal is I'm going to be working on my master's for history this next semester. And I feel confident being able to do that, knowing it's going to be more work. But because I have this additional prep time, I feel like that's something that's going to help me out a lot. That's amazing. And congratulations on getting into the master's program. Thank you. That's exciting. And I'm very happy to hear that you'll have time for homework. You won't be spending (laughs) it on lesson planning. That's good. So, Caleb, you mentioned that you're an instructional lead. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So do you provide coaching to other teachers? This is something that we're talking about possibly doing for next year, having more time. That's something that I might be able to look into, and that's something that I can support with as well because I have the additional time now. That's wonderful. 
I'm curious to hear a bit about the coaching that you've received over the course of the pilot and if there have been any shifts to that. There's been a couple of sh shifts here and there, nothing too much. I will say that I received pretty regular coaching before the pilot. And so I wouldn't say that there's anything that stands out as like a huge change with things. But I, once again, I would say that it seems like for everything that I have, including like coaching times, it doesn't feel as rushed. I know that I can take a little bit more time to advocate for myself when needed. I can have a little bit more time to delve into an issue that I'm trying to find, trying to help support my EL learners, you know, like there's just a lot more time to delve into things that I need and that the scholars need. And so because of that, a little bit more coaching support is helpful, but it's not anything that's really changed a ton. Dramatically different. Yeah. Have you noticed any changes to your practice just as a result of that coaching or anything specifically that you would pinpoint? Some of the things that I've been able to focus on a little bit more just in my classroom is basically having more time to go through like contextual lessons, giving students more of a context as to why they're learning something and what it means to them. Because I've had additional time, I've been able to go through and really try to expand the lessons that I currently am teaching. And that's something that has set the stage for a lot of student growth. If they're understanding what we are learning about right before we delve into right, our primary secondary source documents and really get into the lessons themselves, that's something that is going to help with their overall growth. And with the additional time that we have this year in prep periods, I've been able to not just introduce these lessons, but I've also been able to fine tune them. And I've been able to tweak them to make them a high quality that I, I would want to give my students because that's what they deserve. We'll hear from Caleb again later in the season. But for now, I'm curious about our scholars' perspectives on the changes this year. My name is Catalina. I'm an eighth grader at Middle Four. Have you noticed anything different about school in the last year? And if so, what? I wouldn't say that, I, that there was many changes. It felt pretty normal. The only difference is how the schedule would work around since usually our schedule is a bit different and the schedule of which classes we have first, it just changed a little bit, but it's very easy to manage. Did you notice anything different about your teachers during the course of this year? I would say so. I think how the planning days allowed the teachers to kind of be more collective, because especially approaching near the end of the school year, some teachers are running out of what to do. They need to hurry up and add some grades in and everything. But I think the planning days really helps get them to relax a little bit because they kind of have like an extra day longer and it's fully dedicated to that. So I think the planning days really help the teachers be more engaged in their own lesson for the students. Next time on Reimagining the Alliance Educator at the Podcast. We go back to Valera Middle Academy to talk to the staff about the types of expanded enrichment and intervention opportunities this extra planning time has created for their scholars. We focus on academic rigor. We want students to grow academically, and that's not easy. And at the end of the day, what else is there? And what else can the kid get excited about? And so both the electives and the sports were about trying to create a school environment where more people felt connected and felt like they belonged and had something to be excited about and a real reason to come to school. That's next time on Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast. If you're interested in learning more about Alliance College Ready Public Schools, in becoming an educator or enrolling your child, visit lealliance.org. Or if you're already a part of the Alliance community and are interested in the Reimagining the Alliance Educator program, reach out to your school leader. Let them know you think this is a good idea and ask for more information on how your school can join. And don't forget to rate the show. It really helps spread the word, which will hopefully inspire more schools to try something new. Reimagining the Alliance Educator, the podcast is produced by the Alliance College Ready Public Schools Home Office Team with producer and writer Monique Madrid, Jace Stewart, 
and myself, Sonia Grant. Sound and editing was done by Jacob Tomino and Travis Thompson. Alliance's CEO is Pablo Villavicencio. Special thanks to Middle Forest Principal Eva Flores Coops, teacher Caleb Klinger, and our scholar Catalina. Brought to you by Alliance College Ready Public Schools.